My Lord, I appear with Mr. Ditchin and Miss Montford for the survey parties. Uh, my learned friends, Mr. Turner, Mr. Holmes, Mr. Drake, Mr. Wolf, Mr. Gregory, and Miss McAndrew appear with the claimants. Um, but my Lord, in terms of housekeeping, um, I think there are th th there's one point to mention, and there's also my learned friends have an application in relation to some additional materials which uh, they wanted yes. to put into the bundles. The, the point to mention is that. Um, the, the pagination, if, if my lords are working from the electronic bundles, um, it's the printed number plus two across all of the PDF bundles. So I, I will try and remember to give you that we've as got, well. But got, I think at the it, moment we've gone using the... Oh, well, that's, that'll make it much easier, my lord, I think, yeah. if we're all in paper. Um, yes. And there, is a, there is a... You probably would have may have seen from years ago, there was a, a, a sort of spoof... Rule that Lord Justice said was about bundles, about how you, know, you had to make sure that no two two bundles contained the same page references. So there, there is floating around an updated version for electronic bundles, which um, some which is entirely true. One of one of the difficulties is that the, the, the electronic bundle never bears the same numbering as the, as the paper bundle. No, 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 but we, we can we can. Uh, satisfy my lord on that <laughs> aspect of the practice direction, but unusually we've managed to be consistent across all of the other well, that's very good. <laughs> so, no, so that's all. Okay, good. Um, my, my lord, so the, the I, I'm not sure if it would be convenient for my lord to consider my lord of friend's application in relation to the additional... Well, we'll deal with it in due course. Um, the, the reason for, for not allowing, can I just say, Sorry. is that in competition appeals, not not my lord, this is my experience in the recent past. Lord Justice Green and I have had to endure a number of cases where endless documents have arrived late uh, for which um, or there's been disregard of, of any direction that's been given by the court. And we're just trying to get this under a bit more control. Now I appreciate this is not, it's not an egregious breach of anything, but I just wanted to to get the message out there, really to, to members of the competition bar and their instructing solicitors that uh, you know, we're getting a bit fed up with um, late stuff coming in. Oh, well, I All right. Uh, well, so, uh, as you will have seen, the, uh, Servier appeals from Mr Justice Roth on three grounds. Uh, the first and primary ground uh, starts by adopting the judge's factual findings on the first two preliminary issues, namely whether it was reasonable or appropriate in the relevant period for a clinician to prescribe another brand of ACE inhibitor in lieu of perindrogel. And the appeal is to the judge's conclusion in the light of those factual findings that no primary care trust or health board anywhere in the UK needed to take any steps whatsoever at any time beyond what they in fact did. And that, that, so they didn't have to do anything to encourage cost-effective prescribing of ACE inhibitors. Um, and I'll come on in a moment to where we say the judge fell into error uh, by, by reference to the judgment, but it, it, we, we say that is a very stark and sweeping conclusion against the facts of this case and, and the background that, that the judge heard. Yeah. Um, the second and third grounds, my lords, affect matters if we're successful on the first. So they are not freestanding grounds I I in that sense. Um, in those grounds, we challenge the judge's findings in relation to major adverse cardiac events, which are called MACE, in, in the judgment and papers. So those are essentially heart attacks, um, and, uh, and we also challenge them on stroke as well. Um, in both cases, the essence of the appeal is that the reasoning that the judgment, uh, reasoning in the judgment, offers no proper basis for the rejection of the unanimous expert evidence on those points. But as I say, they, those are grounds which are, as it were, subsidiary, and if they we don't... Are, we, they're entirely dependent on they, success they, on ground one. My, my lord, yes. So we accept that if we don't succeed on ground one, then you needn't trouble yourselves with two and three. Um, I should highlight a division of labour on our side of the court, at least, and I suspect there may be one on the other side too. Um, Mr Pitchenham, I'll address you on the first ground and the background. Uh, more generally, Mr Pitchenham will address you on grounds two and three, if, okay. if that's convenient. Um, and I've spoken to my learned friends. In terms of timekeeping, um, we propose to save around an hour for reply, so I'll finish at an appropriate point today uh, to, to, to achieve that. Um, what, what I propose to do by way of opening the appeal is to start with the background, just so that to orientate my lords as to how the issues in the case arose and where we are more generally in the claim. Um, and then um, 
where we submit that the judge fell into error by reference to the judgment. And as I go through, I'll pick up the main themes that my learned friends have developed in their skeleton argument on each of those points. So that um, I think it's probably a more convenient way to do it as we go through, rather than uh, uh, as it were through a sort of uh, a series of potpourri points at the end. But let's um, let them see how we go. So um, by way of background, um, these claims, as my lords have seen, are three sets of competition damages claims brought against Servier, various Servier entities by respectively the English NHS, the Scottish NHS, uh, and, and the Northern Irish NHS in one action, and thirdly, the Welsh NHS. So they're, they're three different claims. The claims were originally commenced with all of the various primary care trusts, st strategic health authorities, and health boards in the UK as individual co-claimants. So it was the, it, the, the NHS was then reorganized and the claimants became the successor entities to those PCTs as a result of the Health and Social Care Act 2012. And you'll see that in paragraph 4A of the particulars. <coughs> and if you look at the, at the annex to the particulars, you'll see a long list of the individual claimants that, that, that form part of the action. So although we now see a very small number of individual claimants, they're really, as it were, the umbrella mm -hmm. under which a diverse group of individual local level claimants have vested their claims. Um, if, my Lord, if you want the reference to the, uh, my Lord, the Chancellor, if you, if, if I can take you to the, the reference. No, don't worry. Don't worry. Um, so it's essentially it's just that it's an annex to the particulars of claim, and paragraph 4a is the best thing yep. paragraph. Okay. Um, I'll, if I may, I'll just refer to the English claim because actually, mm -hmm. as, as the judge did, the Welsh and Scottish claims are in similar, similar effect, and actually the pleadings carry through. It's convenient just to refer to the English. Um, now, the overall value of the claim is made up by the, of the aggregate of the individual sums that are said to be lost um, by those individual PCTs and health boards doing the prescribing that they did. Um, some of those will be big contributors to the overall sum that is claimed. Others of them will be much smaller. Um, they are, as I'll come on to submit in a moment, a very diverse group. Um, now, in terms of the pharmaceutical itself, this concerns a prescription-only drug called perindropil, which is one of a number of drugs which form a class called ACE inhibitors. And ACE inhibitors are drugs that work by preventing a particular enzyme in the body from producing something called angiotensin II, which is a substance which has the effect of narrowing blood vessels. And the, the narrowing can cause higher blood pressure, and it also forces the heart to work harder, squeezing the blood through the vessels. Uh, around the body. And angiotensin also causes hormones to be released that raise blood pressure. So ACE inhibitors are one of a number of different treatments that are particularly useful in patients that have high blood pressure. They, as it were, relax the, the blood vessels and increase the volume in which the blood flows and thus lower the, 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 the pressure. Um, they're also licensed for less common uh, coronary conditions, such as prophylaxis. Uh, for patients at risk of major adverse cardiac events, such as heart attacks. So it's a good thing to take if you want to prevent a repeat heart attack and, uh, and so on. Um, so ACE inhibitors, are, so these are drugs that are of particular importance for hypertension and heart attack patients. They tend, on the whole, to be older patients. And these, these are drugs that are generally taken for many, many years by those patients. They're not a short one-off course of medication. You, no. you tend to be on them, a bit like statins. You might be on them for quite some time. Yeah. Um, my lords, the, the basis of the claims made by the NHS is the assertion that Servier's anti-competitive conduct delayed the date on which other drugs companies could bring generic versions of perindropil to the market in the UK. So in essence, the claimants say that the various NHS entities in the UK were caused to spend more on perindropil prescriptions than they would have spent if they could have alternatively prescribed cheaper generic perindropil because the generic companies were left off, were kept off the market. And there are three aspects to the allegations. Firstly, the, there are arguments that there were misrepresentations in obtaining and enforcing the underlying patent rights. That was said to be an abuse of dominance and thus infringe Article 102 and also it constituted the economic tort of causing loss by unlawful means. Um, the Supreme Court struck out that economic tort claim in, in 2021. 
so that's gone. Um, Secondly, there are agreements which are said to offend Articles 101 and 102 on the basis that they improperly delay generic entry onto the market. And thirdly, there's a purchase of technology from a third party which is said to offend Article 102. Now, those latter two arguments are currently live before the European Court. And in respect of those EU proceedings, the background is that the European Commission reached a decision in 2014 that Servier had infringed Article 1 and Article 101 and 102. Uh, that was then appealed to the General Court. On appeal, the General Court claims were rejected by the General Court. Uh, sorry, the, the, the Article 102 abuse of dominance claims were rejected on the basis that the Commission was wrong about market definition. And so Servier wasn't in a, a dominant position on the relevant market. So, so Servier succeeded on that aspect at first instance. The case was then appealed to the Court of Justice, and there, all we've had so far is the Advocate General's opinion. She has formed the opinion that the General Court made errors in that Article 102 analysis, and so the case needs to go back to the General Court for reconsideration. The Article 101 claims were upheld by the General Court, except in relation to one generic company, which was Kirka, but the Advocate General said on appeal to the Court of Justice that the General Court was wrong about that too, and that Servier's application for annulment in respect to the Kirker Agreement should be rejected without the need for a remittal. So we are waiting presently and continue to wait for the Court of Justice to rule. Uh, we don't know when that judgment will be forthcoming. It's been 11 months since the Advocate General's opinion, so it seems reasonably likely we will get it in the next few months, but at, at present we don't have a date. Um, now, obviously, if the Article 102... You're not inviting us to delay... Handing down judgment. Uh, no, my lord, because it's not. You know, uh, unless my lord's tempted. It's just to part do. of the background. No, this this is all just setting up. Uh, I, but it does. Uh, I'll come on to in a moment because one of the if we're right about the appeal, one of the things which I anticipate will be on my lord's minds yeah. is what next. Yes. And and it's quite important that you understand the context of where we are in no, the understand. case more, more more broadly. Um. So uh, if the Article One Hundred Two claims are disposed of then these UK damages claims will be limited to just the Article 101 claims. If it's not disposed of, then everything is live in the UK proceedings, save for the economic talks that were struck out by the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Now, it is common ground between the parties that this UK action can't proceed to final trial until the Commission proceedings and all the various appeals have been resolved in the EU, and the judge reflected that in the judgment of paragraph 24. Um, Servier, of course, as my lords might anticipate, denies the various competition infringements and also denies that its conduct had any effect at the time on, at the time on which the generic entry occurred. Um, the court hasn't yet heard any evidence on that. Um, the principal reason that Servier maintains that is that the generics companies couldn't just launch their products. They had to get over a series of technical, commercial, regulatory and other patent challenges in order to get onto the UK market. And Servier says the generics companies would not have been likely to have got the product on the market any quicker than they actually did. Um, if we're right about that, then all of the claims fall away, regardless of the position on the preliminary issues trial. Um, now, although the case has been running for many years, and my lords may have seen Mr. Uh, Mr. Nicholas Green QC, as he then was, was yes. one of the people that pleaded it, um, and various other members of the judiciary appear at various times on some yes. of the earlier pleadings. Um, it's not often we have cases which still involve the old style case and I was going back to 2011. Yes, it, it's um, something that has a sort of vintage flavour. Um, <laughs> but, but although the, um, <coughs> my lords, the, the case has been running for many years, and although we've had disclosure on some issues, none of the other trial preparation stages have taken place. So there are no directions in place for witness statements or expert reports. And once this appeal has been resolved one way or another, the court will be starting with what is in effect almost a blank page on the wider case management issues, and there's no trial date set down and so on. So we have a, a CMC in December for two days before Mr Justice Roth, the point of which is to consider the future conduct of the proceedings generally, um, and hopefully we'll have the Court of Justice decision out in good time before that so that we will know where we are. Yep. Um, but So that is the shape of the case and where we are in the action more generally. Um, the next aspect I'll address you on just by way of background is how we ended up with the preliminary issues trial and what led to that. Can I ask just before you yes, do that? I haven't, I'm sorry, 
thing that's I haven't quite understood the difference between whether the claim under Article 101 is upheld or the claim under Article 102. What difference does it make to the claims for damages? Uh, so there are different aspects. So the, the 101 claims are in relation to certain agreements between Sovier and various generics companies, which are alleged to have delayed the entry of products onto the market. So causally, the damage caused by that may be by reason of the delay, if, if, that is, if, if that's established. Uh, the Article 102 damages cases or a more general abuse of dominance um, uh, 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 as a result of uh, uh, what, what is said to be um, a, a series of um, series of points about abusive behavior more, more generally in relation to uh, the, the um, manipulation of uh, an abuse of dominance and access to the market, the, the abuse of the patent system and so on. Um, so one, one of the things that this case actually, my, my lords may see from the pleadings, has a very unusual aspect to it, which is that the obtaining and seeking of the patents and the defense of the patents that were the underlying patents protecting the drug was said in itself to be an abuse. Um, uh, and so that that's it. it gauges all sorts of quite interesting issues about the interplay between monopolies granted by by by, by the patent system and quite whether they can constitute an abuse in terms of your behaviour in, in seeking them. Uh, that is all, thankfully, for another day, if, if we ever get to that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, also, the preliminary issues trial, um, the, this was concerned with what Mr Justice Henderson, back in 2016, described as the prescribing argument. And it's important, if I may, to take you to the pleadings on that. Can we have a look at the, the pleadings in the English case, uh, particularly the defence? So that's the core bundle, tab 10, uh, page 312. So this is the, the bit of the pleading that we're concerned. You'll see that starting at heading K1. Um, the, 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 the section of the pleading entitled Failure to Mitigate Causation Remoteness and or Contributory Negligence. Um, and then just below that, you'll see that there are failure, it's alleged there are failure to take all reasonable steps to encourage switching to cheaper ACE inhibitors, just over the page. The claimants should have been aware that alternative ACE inhibitors were available in generic form, in particular elanopril, lisinopril, and ramopril. Those are alternatives. Um, the second paragraph, B, ACE inhibitors exhibit a class effect, and so there's no clinical difference between perindropril and the others available. And thirdly, the reimbursement prices were generally, they were significantly less than the price of perindropil. So there are cheaper alternative drugs available, that's the premise. And then 83C sets out the, the particulars of what we say should have been done. The claimants should have taken all reasonable steps to encourage switching from the prescription of perindropil to the prescription of cheaper alternative ACE inhibitors in generic form. In particular, but without limitation, the claimants should have. And then we have a series of indented steps, they should have removed perindropil from local formularies. Um, so PCTs and health boards often have their own recommended drugs, uh, which they put in a local formulary, um, which are often used by their clinicians. Um, one of the witnesses described how they, um, he had it, it was something that would be laminated and stuck up on the notice board. And generally the idea is that those are the frontline drugs that that particular PCT recommends for <coughs> those particular indications. The idea being that pharmacists will stock it in the local area and that these are drugs that the local hospital might be happy with and, and, and so on. But a big aspect as well is making sure that the local prescribers, because there's freedom of choice in prescribing generally, so local prescribers are steered towards cost-effective selections of, of, of medication. So that's the local formularies. Um, with B is we say that there should have been national guidance <coughs> encouraging a switch. C was that we, there should have been local PCT guidance encouraging <coughs> the switch. Um, the, the guidance is not limited to any particular form of guidance, so it could be written or oral, but um, there are guidelines and newsletters and various other things that we saw um, in, in, in the preliminary.
engineering issues trial. Um, uh, and um, one of the things that we saw from the evidence as well was that PCTs were generally monitoring, or some of them were monitoring prescribing general practitioners. And general practitioners on the whole are independent contractors. Um, and what they would do is they'd keep an eye on them. And if they were prescribing overly expensive branded drugs, when they could have been prescribing cheaper alternatives or generic alternatives, then they were subject to a process of, um, uh, how to describe it, sort of re-education by the local PCT, who would, who would single them out from their reports and say, this, we've got someone here who's an errant high-value prescriber. Let's have a look at what they're actually doing. Um, and that, of course, is a sensible thing to do because it saves money on the drugs bills, which the NHS ultimately needs. Um, when we say encouraging a switch, there are two different types of behaviour. There's encouraging a prescriber to switch their practice in relation to prescribing perindropil to patients on an ACE inhibitor for the first time. So if, if my lords, if you or I go to a GP or have an appointment and it's discovered we have high blood pressure, <coughs> and the GP may then prescribe a course of ACE inhibitors at that appointment. Um, so that's a, a new presentation of a patient where a patient is initiated on uh, ACE inhibitors. Uh, there is also a, a switch where there are existing established patients on these ACE inhibitors and where one medication is being used, so for example, they're on perindropril, and there's an equivalent medication, so ramipril, another one, and the question is whether they can be switched from perindropril prescriptions to ramipril prescriptions. That's a slightly more complicated situation because in there you've got to, you're, you're actually prescribing a, a, a different drug. So that, that's the, there is the, you'll hear in a moment, and you'll see in the judgment, the two different types of switching. Um, D is about incentivizing a switch. Now, one of the things that the, uh, when the GPs had their uh, contracts renegotiated, um, the, um, the, the, um, uh, the thing was introduced called the Quality and Outcomes Framework, the QOF, as it's known. And um, that um, incentivized, financially incentivized GPs <coughs> to do certain things. So you, points could be allocated to certain types of behavior, and then a GP would be paid on whether they hit those particular points. And so this is essentially the same idea, but using financial incentives. E is about a piece of software called Script Switch. Um, so now generally when a doctor sits on their computer and writes a prescription, some prompts come up. Imagine, um, imagine someone, I go to the doctor with a headache and the doctor says, I'm going to type in on this computer, I'll prescribe you some Nurofen. So the software will then kick in and say, um, that prescription should be generically written for ibuprofen rather than the branded. Neurofen product, unless the, the doctor overrides that. Uh, and then the pharmacist can dispense the generic product rather than the branded one, and that again saves the NHS uh, money. So this is commonly used software amongst GPs. Um, you can also use that software in accordance with formularies to help guide a doctor to prescribe in accordance with the formularies. And if, if printer pill was entered on it, it, it's possible to configure it. So it says, it pops up and says, consider prescribing an alternative ACE inhibitor, perindropril, more expensive. So you can, you can uh, and thereby identifying to the doctor that there's a potential saving that could be made. Obviously, that is still subject to the doctor's clinical judgment at the time. But one of the issues that you, my lord, will see is that there was an issue at trial about how substitutable, whether there was a class effect between these different drugs. Um, we don't have F and G. Um, 83D is the, uh, the, 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 the plea which um, says that the defendant is presently unable to particularise the extent to which each individual claimant, don't forget this was pleaded at a time where the claimants have assumed the individual role of the PCTs who were the prior claimants, so everything is then vested in the individual claimants, failed to take one or more of the above mentioned steps. Each of the claimants either failed to take the steps of verbal alternative, having taken such steps, failed to take them or any sufficient steps to ensure compliance. So the, the point that has been made is that even if Servier did unlawfully delay the onset of generic competition for the product, its liability for the higher prices paid by the claimants during that delay 
must be reduced to reflect the fact that the claimants could and should, we say, have switched, encouraged NHS doctors to prescribe other ACE inhibitors that were already available in cheaper generic form at the time. Mm. I mean, to put the point the other way, the, the, the question is, why should Servier be held liable for damages where the components of the damages arise from un 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 unreasonably expensive prescribing by people at a local level within the NHS? Um, well, also just while we're in the pleadings, can, can I just pick up one other point which you would have seen from the skeleton arguments is live. Um, can you, if we can just look back at paragraph 83C, um, the, our, our 83C of our defence did not allege all PCTs should have taken, taken the steps set out. It said that the claimants should have taken all reasonable steps. Um, by the time we pleaded that, as I mentioned a moment ago, the, the claimants had had taken over from the individual PCT claimants that have vested their rights in them. Um, but as I mentioned, those claimants are the successor of the claim for the myriad of individual PCTs and health boards that started it. So our pleaded case was that the claimants acting through the PCTs and health boards should have taken all of those steps in, in the defence. It was our primary case that all of them should have taken all of those steps. Uh, but we say the general included the particular in other words, the allegation that all PCTs and health boards should have taken all of those steps includes the lesser allegation that some PCTs and some health boards should have taken some of those steps. Um, and as we'll see, Servier ran, ran the argument in that way at trial um, and foreshadowed it in the lead up to the trial, both in our expert evidence and at various CMCs. Um, we were not, we are not alleging that a subset of the PCTs or health boards should have taken steps other than those in the amended defence. The allegation was that if the court rejected our case that, they, that all of them should have taken all steps at all times, it should have at least found that at least some PCT and health boards should have taken some steps at some, some times. And I'll show you in a moment the, the unanimous expert evidence that all PCTs and health boards should have taken at least some steps to encourage prescribing of generic alternative to perindropil for new patients. So that, as I say, there, there seems to be, through the skeleton arguments, a bit of a debate about the scope of the pleading. The other thing one also notice is that, obviously, in relation to C, this does descend, and in, in relation to uh, A as well, this descends at the local level, as one would imagine, because the behaviour has to be, it, it is that local level that is doing the driving uh, of, of the prescriptions. Uh, just on the just on the claimants point, Mr. Saunders, am I, yes. am I right in that by the time this amended pleading is drafted and served, the claimants were the Secretary of State for Health, that's, the first claimant, that, and the, NH, the NHS Business Services Authority. The that's second correct. So, so if you have, my lord, if you just turn back, only two claimants. That's right. So if you just turn they, back to tab nine, they, the latter had taken over the, okay. the claims of the individual PCTs. On the organisation. Yes. I, I, shall I just show you the so tab nine has the the, the particulars of claim. I can show you the paragraph where they pleaded the assumption of the claim. So it's paragraph four a on page two zero three. Two zero three. Two zero three. Yeah. So the the reorganisation happened on the first of April twenty thirteen, and then by statute, the PCTs. Claims for the rights of action were then sucked into the first claim. Yes. And, and just actually while we're in that document, the, you will see at 258, page 258, the beginning of the long list of all the different PCTs. Yes. So those were the former claimants. Yeah. Um, now, so, so um, well, much of the focus of the preliminary issues trial was on what the local units within the NHS, these PCTs and the health boards in Wales and Scotland, should have done to encourage the prescribing of cheaper alternative ACE inhibitors. However, there was, as, as my lords may have seen, the purpose of this trial was to circumvent disclosure. So the claimants had not received, survey, sorry, the, the, the claimants had not provided disclosure, full disclosure, of what steps they had actually taken 
or providing reasons why they did or did not take those steps at various times. <coughs> so the VA was not in a position to put forward a more nuanced case where we might say, if you take that long list that we saw a second ago, where we pick out numbers 1, 2, 7, 15, 27, and say yeah. they should have done the following. Uh, we, the, the case had not progressed to, to that uh, stage. And why does that matter? It matters because, as I mentioned a moment ago, PCTs and health boards are not a homogenous group. Um, there are two respects in which that's particularly material. Uh, there is a particular priority in one PCT may not be a priority in another um, because of differences in budget or in the differences of the demographics of the population they're serving. <coughs> so the age, ethnicity, income, deprivation, and so on of, of their, their cohort of patients. Now that has obvious implications for the prior priorities in respect of prescribing of ACE inhibitors because they're used on the whole to treat hypertension in older patients. So a PCT that has relatively few old patients and spent relatively little on perindropil, um, it might be perfectly reasonable for that PCT to do nothing at all. Um, say one that was, say a PCT that was covering a university town um, in which the demographics of its patients were on the whole much younger than in other PCTs. That sort of PCT would not be spending much on perindropil relative to its other drugs and its other priorities. But contrast that with one serving a much more elderly cohort of patients, where perindropil was likely to be a much larger part of its overall budget. There, that PCT might have recently, we say, been expected to encourage prescribing of alternatives. Think of a PCT that covers a seaside town where large numbers of elderly retirees uh, with a bigger incidence of hypertension might like to spend their time. The local focus in that PCT, it means that it is much more likely that, that perindropil spending will be a higher proportion of that PCT's overall budget. And, and suppose that there are two PCTs that had big problems with perindropil prescribing, so they were both spending a lot of money on perindropil, but their medicines management teams operated differently. One of the things that was established at trial was that medicines management was a well-known practice, and by that I mean the, the ensuring the effective as, 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 as taxpayers one might hope, ensuring the effective spend of money on the cheapest possible but effective drugs. Um, uh, and one, imagine one of these two PCTs had an incentive scheme up and running, but it didn't cover perindropil because that management team took a wrong view of the evidence, the clinical evidence in relation to perindropil. For that one, we might say they should have included perindropil, but the other one didn't have an incentive scheme because for whatever reasons, their local GPs didn't respond to them for, for whatever reason. Well, they, they might, have been needed, might have needed to use script switch. Um, for that PCT, th their response might have been very different to the first, even though they are both PCTs with peripheral prescribing issues. But we could never have pleaded to that level of detail with about, without the requisite information about the individual PCTs and health boards forming the basis of this rolled up claim. Uh, and that is, uh, as I'll come on to, as it were, the conundrum that lies at the, the root of where we say the judge went wrong. I'll, I'll come to the relevant paragraphs of the judgment in a minute. Um, now, when we sought to amend our defence to add the prescribing argument, the English claimant objected and said that was bad in law. Um, if we make, can we just have a very quick look at the judgment of Mr Justice Henderson? So that's Authorities, Volume 3, Tab 12. The report starts at page 667, and then if I could just pick it up at page 670. So this is the judgment in relation to the introduction of the bit of pleading we've just seen. Uh, now, paragraph 2, just on page 670, is dealing with a different point. This is the point about the delay, which was not objective. So that went in. Um, paragraph three relates to the one that we're now talking about. 
The Scottish and Welsh claimants each consented to Serbia's application to amend its defence, um, uh, but the English uh, claimants objected. A prime motivation of the English claimants in opposing was to make was based on the prescribing argument is that giving disclosure of all documents formerly held by the English Primary Care Trust in relation to the prescribing argument, as well as addressing it, it it's comprehensively in witness evidence and a trial would be extremely burdensome and expensive, and there was the evidence they referred to. However, rightly, that wasn't relied upon by Mr. Drake and Mr. Wolf. Um, and then uh, Mr. Justice Henson then goes on to say, if, if the disputed amendments are allowed, careful consideration will need to be given to the resulting disclosure by the English claimants and the need to keep that within reasonable bounds. Um, for example, by confining it to a representative cross-section of primary care trusts and strategic health authorities. So that was a somewhat prescient observation by, by the judge. Um, but nevertheless, he then granted permission for this amendment to, to be made. Um, but it did create a case management question, which is how does one go about addressing uh, the, these, the, the, the appropriate disclosure in, in these circumstances? Um, and as my lord, I won't labour the point anymore, but it is, this is a bundle of claims, this, this overall case. It's a little, this PCT overspent here, this one spent less there, different or suffering damages or causing damages to be suffered on their case by different amounts. Some of those are going to be very big contributors to the claim, others less so. Now, uh, Mr Justice Roth, in the judgment uh, that uh, under appeal, said, uh, paragraph 27, it's become clear through case management hearings and preliminary expert reports that the sampling approach that Mr Justice Henderson considered wasn't practicable and um, we, we say that's a slightly incomplete account of what happened without we don't criticize the judge for, for this particularly but just in terms of <coughs> history we've set out in our skeleton of 16 to 17 so my lord's got that um, what happened was in 2017 the judge ordered the parties to instruct their experts to seek to agree on a proportionate approach to sampling um, although they didn't reach agreement on the ideal sample, they both agreed that a sampling approach was workable as a matter of principle. So there was a dispute at that stage as to how to do the sample, but no one, the, the principle of sampling was up and done. And then rather than resolving, that then went to a hearing before Mr Justice Roth, um, and then rather than resolving the nature of the sample that could be used, the court cut through that by ordering at that stage what was envisaged to be an expert-led nine-day relatively inexpensive trial of preliminary issues that could identify what a reasonable PCT or health board should have done about protocol prescribing. So that's a sort of archetypal case that could then be used to inform things. Um, what then happened over the subsequent three years is that the vision of a nine-day trial with total costs on each side not running into the millions uh, morphed into a 22-day trial with very large, well, large numbers, I think I've got really exactly 12 or 13 factual evidence witnesses for the claimants, um, where the claimants say they incurred six million in costs, to say nothing of Servier's costs. And the reason that the expansion occurred is because of the introduction of a lot of factual material, both documentary and witness evidence, relating to the approaches that particular PCTs and health boards selected by the claimants took to encourage cost-effective prescribing during the relevant period. Um, so what they did was they provided witness statements that explained in detail the particular steps that had been taken by three PCTs or health boards. Those were Plymouth, the Rhonda, and the Highlands. And um, those are those were then, we, we then had documents relating to those, and we cross-examined witnesses, the medicine management teams of the, those various people and various other witnesses in relation <coughs> to the specific things that has happened in those three PCTs and health boards. Um, now, one has to be very careful with that because there's no suggestion that those three were in some way statistically representative of parts of the wider cohort. And you have to be, uh, one has to be very careful generally about that kind of evidence. And we've had, this, this court has seen similar issues um, in connection with surveys in trademark cases um, a, a number of times and passing off cases. We mentioned 
the relevant authorities there in our skeleton at footnote seven, I won't take you to those, but there are two judgments of Lord Justice Lewison and Interflora. Um, the, the, the reason that that arose was there was something of a tradition in those cases. Um, funny enough, started by somebody who then joined this court, um, of bringing a minibus full of confused consumers to trial. And what happened was that those consumers were then given evidence saying, well, I'm confused between the trademark and the defendant's sign. And then the judge would see where, how probative that evidence was. The point that Lord Justice Lewison made was, how do you know that these people are actually probative of anything broader than their own individual views? Because unless you have a statistically and fairly conducted survey lying behind them, it's very difficult for the court to take that evidence and say, well, that person is, the, as it were, the archetype of 15% of the population, and this person is the archetype of 26% of the population, or whatever. Uh, all you end up with is just a sort of potpourri of individually carefully selected views by those individual people. And that is something of, a, a, of an evidential problem for the court, because it's very difficult to then assess what weight to put on that evidence that the court's heard. And so that, that's, that's essentially what Lord Justice Lewis had said in, in those interflora cases. Um, now, the, port, the PCTs and health boards that the claimants selected here were, in that sense, also probative of their own position. We got into an inquiry and we cross-examined the relevant witnesses so we could get to the bottom of what happened in Plymouth, what happened in Rhonda in the Highlands. And I'll come on in a moment to the specific criticisms we made in the light of evidence to what they had individually done, those three boards. Um, but what you can't tell from that is what the wider position is, because there's nothing to, that says that Plymouth is in some way uh, 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 representative of 18 other health boards. So that, is, that was an inherent difficulty in the approach that, 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 that we had. Inherent in the whole exercise was this like, notion of uh, local and granular response to the cost of Perindrabil and what they say was the delay amongst a very heterogeneous group of individual PCTs and health boards. So, and as we explained in uh, the skeleton argument on appeal, following the explosion of, or the, the introduction of that additional evidence, Servier sought to stop or stay the whole process. Uh, we attempted, in particular, Miss, Miss Bacon, the QC, as she then was, uh, uh, took stock of that and, and tried to suggest that um, the trial should be vacated. That was rejected by the judge. Um, now, we are not saying that, that I mean, this is not an appeal of that decision to continue with the, um, the, with the preliminary institute trial. Uh, and one of the points that my learned friends develop in their skeleton argument is they say in paragraphs 53 to 54, uh, there's an assertion that ground one of our appeal is really an attack on that case management in disguise. Um, that isn't what we're saying. Um, uh, and they say on our logic that the preliminary issue trial was never going to be able to make dispositive findings. Uh, that, that's not right, we, we say. And actually, the question is, you've got to look for present purposes at how the judge approached the third question in the light of his factual findings in, the first, in relation to the first two. But the preliminary issue trial had utility um, it, it, because um, it could have achieved a lot if we'd won across the whole board. Um, obviously, we would say that, but if we had done, then that would have been um, uh, beneficial, uh, it would have, in terms of case management at least. It could have achieved a lot if the respondents' fundamental objections to our case had succeeded. So they made a number of points. They said that there were medical reasons to prefer perindropil. Our marketing efforts effectively have stopped us from being able to rely on this mitigation defence. Um, their legal objection that no mitigation defence where the claimant's loss is the flip side of the coin from our gain. If any of those points had succeeded, then that again would have cut through a lot of issues. But all of those objections collapsed or failed on the evidence at trial um, uh, 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 and the, the judge's rulings on the law. But where we have ended up is that we have all learnt a great deal through the preliminary issue trial. We have learnt, we have seen evidence from in particular some of the experts who have looked at the wider prescribing data and set it up to try and spot, for example, which PCTs are particularly big prescribers. But um, we don't, we, 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 that 
that learning process, and we've been through the exercise in relation to three PCTs looking at mm -hmm. their witnesses and their documents. But beyond that, we, the, the preliminary issue trial in, in, in our submission um, hasn't looked at that granular level of detail. And I'll, I'll come back in a moment to how we say that flows through into the judgment. Now, the, one of the key points which the respondents miss, we say, is that even as framed and ordered by the court, the third issue um, could have been answered, as it were, across the board, without reference to particular PCTs, but in a way that had the consequence that certain PCTs should have taken certain steps. And that's something that we flagged repeatedly as well. Um, uh, and actually, maybe if I could just bring up Miss, Miss Bacon's skeleton, as she then was, um, just to show you that. Uh, so that's the supplemental bundle, tab eight. So this is a, a skeleton, this is a CMC from January 2019. And uh, if we could just look at page 79 in the bundle, page nine in the skeleton. And you'll see that D was uh, the, the submission, paragraph D in the middle of page 79. Uh, so the, there's the very real risk that the preliminary issues trial will ultimately decide nothing, or virtually nothing of value, even within the narrow compass. Um, claimants have abandoned their case on issue D, which reflects that was a position on the law, which they only took. There's no, form, no longer any knockout legal obstacle. What's left is a messy question of fact about what was reasonable at national and local PCT level. As to that factual debate, the claimants have positively advanced evidence of highly effective steps that some PCTs and other organisations took. Uh, Miss Watson, so she was the lady who uh, was at Plymouth, saved £94,000 from a relatively modest incentive scheme in one particular year. Uh, she says each PCT would have distinct local priorities and, and so on. If her evidence is taken at face value, it's at least possible the court may conclude that some or all PCTs needed to take at least some steps. Uh, to satisfy the duty to mitigate, but will be unable to formulate a single set of steps that all PCTs need to implement across the board. Um, their favour, anyway. So th this was this was part of the concern that was raised, but that was a, an approach that could have been taken. And you'll see, I'll come on in a moment to the way that we closed the preliminary issues trial, which is that, as it were, the 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 high level, um, the the across the board considerations have different manifestations within different types of PCT. Um, my Lord, now the next stage in the process was the exchange of expert evidence. Um, so this in includes not only the exchange of statements, but there were also uh, the agreement of joint statements between the experts. Um, Servier's expert on prescribing guidance and policies um, was uh, Ms. Sarah Kerr, and she worked in a medicines management role in the PCT during the relevant period. And she, in her expert report, identified various minimum steps that she considered that the claimants and their predecessors, the PCTs and the health boards, needed to take in particular circumstances in order to be described as reasonable in their approach to encouraging cost-effective prescribing. And if I may, I'll just take you very briefly to that section of her report, because we'll see in a moment how it comes into the judgment. Uh, so that's the supplemental bundle, again, tab 10. Um, so, and then if I, get to this, if I could take you to 139 in the bundle. Um, but also actually, just if I could, just just before we get to one three nine, can we look at one three six? Um, so this, you'll see, there's a graph there at the top of the page, and this is one of a number of graphs. I'm not saying to my lords that this is the the graph that was finally accepted. There was some evidence from the claimants expert in relation to this, but you'll see the relative costs of these different drugs. The pyridropil is up there, up the top, and there was quite a lot of evidence at trial 
of that sort, looking at different graphs, and you've obviously the judge also considered that as well in, in, in his judgment. So that's, as it were, the, the price differentials that, that I was referring to. Um, so back to page 139 in the bundle, page 51 in, in the report. Um, so there, this is Miss Kerr's identification of various things that she should be, she says, as a, as a person who had worked in, in a PCT during that period, various minimum steps that should have been done. Uh, so um, she, she said that there should have been a prescribing, that this prescribing outlook publication uh, should have incorporated it into local plans. So this is a, a kind of communication channel uh, that, that goes down. Page 148, if we can just skip through to that. That's, so that, that this is all about horizon scanning for the next few pages. The next one, B, is on page 148. Uh, packed data, so subparagraph B, uh, and then paragraph 429 is, is about um, packed data. That's prescribing information. So what was prescribed by whom? Uh, and um, they should have monitored data within the PCT, which is a fairly self-evident thing to be doing if you want to get a handle on how much people are spending. Um, the local formulary, 430, 431. You'll see that in 430, she says, they should have included a generic ACE inhibitor as a preferred option on the local formulary, 431. Uh, prioritizing medicines, medicines within the formulary was an effective way of encouraging clinicians to prescribe. Uh, and then 439 is the next one. Oh, sorry, there's newsletters, D, 435. On the next page, we have guidelines. Uh, 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 and then 443, we have script switch, which I've already described. So, my lord, that, uh, and actually, sorry, 150 over the page, some evidence there in relation to the prescribing incentive scheme. So, that's the way that everything was set up. Um, and what you will have seen, hopefully, just even briefly, by doing that is we've seen that some PCTs, her evidence was not that everyone should have done everything in perhaps the, 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 the rather less precise way that we had pleaded it, uh, because we say that, as it were, everyone should do everything for, for the pleading, but that encompasses individual people doing individual things. You'll see that her position was slightly, somewhat more nuanced. Some of the things needed should have been done by some trusts in some circumstances and other things not. So for example, script switch and the prescribing incentive schemes. It's one thing, to, if you have a prescribing incentive scheme in place, to steer that incentive scheme to control spending on per pill, <coughs> it's possibly a completely different thing to have to set one up in the first place. Because you can imagine that that's a, a rather different type of step and a hugely different ask for the local authority. And again, dealing with, you know, setting it up for the first place where it's just dealing with perindra pill would be a slightly surprising thing to do. But if you have it up and running and it's dealing with three other things, why not add perindra pill to the list? That, that's essentially the distinction. Um, now, if we look at the joint statement with the claimant expert, that's in the supplemental bundle tab 13. So this was with Professor Chapman. And as you may have seen from the judgment, the judge, the, the uh, Ms. Kerr and Ms. Professor Chapman were, uh, gave concurrent evidence. They were hot tubbed by the judge who asked a series of questions of them. But um, one of the things that they agreed um, in their joint statement, um, so what they, they, they produced a joint statement which consists of a series of propositions. And if we can just look at tab 13, page 174. <coughs> sorry, 185, I'm sorry, 185. So as you, as you can see, some of these agreements they didn't reach agreement on. Some are slightly more nuanced, but Proposition 31 on page 185, in between the whole punches, uh, PCTs or health boards should have included or sought to have included on the local formulary a generic ACE inhibitor as a preferred choice. We agree. Um, and you'll recall that in the context of the pleadings that I showed you earlier on in terms of uh, <coughs> the local formularies. Um, so there was common ground between the experts on some of these points um, and some of the steps that, that may have been appropriate. 
obviously, and we accept aspects of this, but other aspects of this are context dependent, and that was something we looked at in relation to those three health boards on which we heard detailed evidence uh, in more detail. Um, we then came to trial. Now, the way we put our case at trial rested on a series of key <coughs> propositions, and we've set those out in the skeleton argument at paragraph 27 to 29 by reference to our closing submissions. Um, so what we, our submission was that at all material times, all patients who were in fact prescribed perindropil could, from a clinical perspective, equally have been prescribed another ACE inhibitor that was available generically. Secondly, that all material times there was a substantial price gap between perindropil and other substitutable ACE inhibitors. Uh, that all material times ACE inhibitors were a high spend area. And finally, that the claimants were responsible for managing their respective health budgets to provide health services. Um, so the claimant's case, as it was developed at least uh, uh, at that stage, was that whatever they did was ipso facto reasonable, as a matter of fact. So there was nothing more that they were required to do other than what had actually happened. That was the, the position they took. And, and because the preliminary issue trial was being conducted without disclosure of what the claimants in these various PCTs and health boards actually did, their case, we say, is that it would have had to have been reasonable for all PCTs and health boards right across the whole UK to do nothing about perindropil prescriptions during the relevant period. And we said that as a proposition cannot be right. And as Miss Bacon alluded to in that kind of an argument I showed you earlier, the problem is you do end up in a, in as it were, a, a sort of factual soup by doing this. Because the position is that certain individual PCTs, what may have been reasonable for them was one thing, other PCTs, it might not have been reasonable for. So the question is, how do you identify characteristics of those PCTs that put them on a list, here are our top 10, that should have done something about that, and by that we've knocked off 80% of the claim, or quite how you do it. But that, that is the exercise that needs to, yeah. needs to be undertaken. Um, so um, following cross-examination, we put our case in closing on the basis of propositions that there was never any rational basis to prefer for Indrapil. Um, and we've summarized all this in the skeleton again. It was always cheaper to prefer lisinopril and ramipril. The one thing we saw through the evidence was that there are pockets of very heavy perindropril prescribing in certain PCTs. That's no, if you think about that, it's not a particularly surprising thing because there are going to be certain PCTs where the demographics of the patients they serve are going to particularly present with hypertension or mace or stroke. And so this is going to be a drug that is prescribed for a long time for those patients. Um, and uh, that the, the, the claimants had effective tools to address that. Also, presumably, PCTs where hospital consultants were in favour of Gurindra. Well, yes, so that's... And prescribed, um, or prescribed it, as it were, the first time. And then the GPs carried on prescribing it. Well, so, so we did look at some of those aspects at, at trial as well. So the, the, the one of the things that there, there are different, as it were, subcategories of patients. If you were established by a hospital consultant, the way the evidence came out, and this is perhaps rather unsurprising, is that the GP might be rather reluctant mm -hmm. to change the, the, the medication that the consultant had prescribed mm -hmm. um, because they don't want to. They, they think for whatever clinical reason that's the one that the consultant has taken. However, there is a large cohort of patients who present at the GPs, and that is uh, uh, and that is where the, uh, the, the, the they could be initiated on on, on an alternative yeah. to perindropil. Um, and the other thing that emerged at trial is that, um, without putting the point too highly, when one looks analytically at some of the prescribing decisions by some some groups of consultants. They're not always informed by terribly good consideration of the evidence. They're sometimes just, this is how Mr. X does it, and so that's what happens. And no one has really looked at or challenged that way. And that is just a, a human, uh, a, a kind of product of the human interface between the consultants and, and the GPs. But one of the jobs we say of the medicines 
management teams at a local level was to use the evidence, the, the clinical evidence, to help guide local prescribers to see that there were alternatives available. And so this is, these are all different interfaces to, in particular, primary care, GPs prescribing, um, as to what should be up there at the top of the list of the local formulary. And we saw formularies with number one, Ramipril, Brindropril down in second tier. And when you look at the effect of that being on the formulary, you saw over time that Brindropril prescriptions drop. Because if you initiate new patients on something other than Brindropril, then incrementally the prescriptions drop. And um, part of the thing is if you, the, 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 some aspects of this patient cohort uh, unfortunately, don't always survive a hugely long time if they've had major cardiac events and so on. So there is a kind of natural attrition in the patient cohort as well. It wasn't part of your case in this trial that guidance should have been given to dissuade the consultants in hospitals. Yes. It was. Yes, it was. So we, we got well. We, we got into debates with some of the about the uh, basis on which. And there's a long section in the judgment where the judge gives a very detailed view of uh, that evidence as to whether some of the consultants should have been prescribing this or not. And he formed a view as to our expert, Professor Brown, who was from Addenbrooke's in Cambridge, and, and some of the other experts on hypertension and what they should and shouldn't have been prescribing at certain times. Um, but as I say, we don't seek to challenge. I mean, there is a very long and very detailed section in the judgment where he weighs up all this evidence and forms a series of conclusions. That doesn't form the basis of my appeal today. Um, but what we do is we take that at face value, as I'll show you in a second, and then we need to look at what is the consequence for the bigger defence as a, as a whole, and where does this get us as a matter of case management. So, um, so, so we submitted that... Um, so the, on the basis of those propositions um, uh, and the way that we had uh, developed those at trial, we submitted that all of the PCTs or health boards should have did, done at least something uh, to encourage the initiation of lisinopril and ramipril rather than perindropril. That's our written posing at 228C, uh, Supplemental Bundle, Tab 21, page 346. We also submitted that PCTs and health boards for whom, whom perindropril expenditure was significant in 2005 or 2006, should have taken at least some steps to encourage switching of existing patients. So this is where someone is established on another one, they should do something to swap them across. And that's our written closing at 228. Um, so th in addition, we criticized the detail of the PCTs that the claimants had selected um, we criticised Plymouth PCT on the basis that it should have introduced an incentive programme one or two years earlier than it did. We criticised Rhonda on the basis that its incentive schemes should have been more narrowly targeted. And the Highland joint formularies um, we criticised on the basis that they should have had uh, Ramipril and Lysinopril as their first line choices rather than Brindropril. Um, but the point is, even those submissions in relation to those specific um, PCTs were not all or nothing. Um, can we just turn up our closing very briefly? That's tab 21 in the supplemental bundle, page 276. So we accept, so 276 in, um, in tab 21, page 4 in the document, paragraph, well you see the heading 3 there on that page. Um, paragraph 6, the court is entitled to conclude that whether it was unreasonable to take steps depends on the circumstances of each PCT or health board. Um, Servier agrees that the reasonableness point turns on what constitutes accepted good practice, however, while a good practice applies generally and we're common knowledge, it flows from the local structure of the NHS that whether a failure to take steps in our pleading departs, may depend on the factual position of each PCT. Thus, the general principles as to what's good practice may not be uniform in their application. 
to take the hypothetical example, it'd be very surprising the PCT was negligible for integral prescribing to be required to do the steps that we say, but the law doesn't require that anyway. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And that's, that, so that is essentially the point which I've been developing before my laws today in, 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 in large part. Now, can I take you to the judgment and to, to the crux of um, the point? Um, can I take you my laws to the judgment and um, how we say, where we say the judge fell into error? <coughs> um, so the starting point in relation to the judgment for present purposes is paragraph 230. So you'll see this comes at the end of a long and extremely detailed section in the judgment dealing with all the various, uh, the cross-examination of Professor Brown and the cross-examination of Dr. Smithard and the various strict guidelines and whether they were established by the right study and, and so on. But this is where the judge sets out his conclusions. And as I say, we don't seek to challenge his conclusions in this paragraph. Um, so he starts off by recognizing quite rightly that there are no simple or binary answer to the questions posed by the first two preliminary issues. The answer varies according to the condition for which the ACE inhibitor is being prescribed, the time period concerned, and the, whether the question relates to a prescription initiating a patient uh, or switching a patient. Obviously, switching is more onerous than just starting a new patient that presents to you. Um, in my judgment, preliminary answers are to be, those preliminary issues are to be answered as follows, for straight or uncomplicated hypertension. Um, so, my lords may have seen that um, hypertension, that you can have, sometimes hypertension comes with various comorbidities, but this is just dealing with a patient who presents with high blood pressure. So a patient initiated on an ACE, I'm looking at uh, 230 Little Women 1A, a patient initiated on an ACE inhibitor prior to late March 2005, it would have been reasonable or appropriate to prescribe lisinopril instead of perindopril, if the appropriate daily dosage of lisinopril was 20 milligrams. However, if it was 40, it was not reasonable because there's no difference in cost. So that's A. B, uh, for patients initiated on an ACE inhibitor from April 2005 onwards, it was reasonable or appropriate to prescribe lisinopril or ramipril instead of perindopril, except where the, the appropriate target dose was 40 or 10 ramipril, and the GP considered the need for titration would be a burden on the patient or their practice. And titration is the process of, as it were, ramping, stepping up the, um, the, 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 the amount that you're prescribed in order to see how that affects your blood pressure. So those, those were the judge's factual findings in uh, uh, one and two. Um, he then goes on to say, subject to the qualifications in timing, it would have been reasonable or appropriate at the next review at the GP surgery to switch somebody with uncomplicated hypertension to like sinopril or ramipril, except where the patient was elderly or frail or vulnerable because of comorbidities with other drugs and interactions and so on. If you're being initiated uh, or, or with, with an ACE inhibitor, um, if, you, if you're being initiated uh, with an ACE inhibitor, there are various other findings, uh, uh, and those are set out in three to, to five. Um, now, in particular, the, the 1B and 2 um, in, in these are of particular significance for the purposes of my appeal. We can look at the judgment at paragraph 265. So this is page 76 in the judgment. Uh, so the Professor Brown, that was our expert from Addenbrooke's, Dr. Dwerden was the claimant's expert. Both of the, those experts looked at some of the prescribing data and the demographics, how they, how they fitted together. Um, they agreed that around 10 to 15% of the UK adult population take medicines for hypertension. 
However, the so-called Barnett study of GP prescribing found that patients with hypertension, only 22% suffered exclusively from hypertension. The rest had other comorbidities. I don't think that figure is very relevant since, as Dr. Dwerf mm -hmm. accepted in cross-examination, the 78% could have all sorts of different things. But Dr. Dwerf gave evidence of a follow-up study that around 18% with hypertension had THD and 10% with post-stroke. Um, and so he goes on to look at the evidence. Um, on that basis, so you'll see just at the end of that paragraph, on that basis seems to be broadly consistent with Servier's internal figures, so this was the Servier's marketing figures, that indicated that in 2005, all prescriptions for Covacil, that's the brand name for Perindropil, just under 25% related to conditions other than uncomplicated hypertension. So 75%, roughly three quarters of the patients treated with ACE inhibitors, were treated for simple hypertension. And the um, unanimous expert evidence, which was set out in our written closings at paragraph 70, was that 20 milligrams or lower was the most common dose for lisinopril, for simple hypertension, and so on. So the conclusion, turning back to the judgment at 2.30, was that there were cheaper alternative um, medications available for large numbers of patients throughout the relevant period. And one can quibble about whether it's 75%, but it's up there, it's a big percentage, a, a very high percentage. For less significant indications, if we can just look back at 230, the judge rejected Servier's case that there were cheaper alternatives. And you'll see in particular this is 3 and 4, so now look at 230 on page 66 of the judgment, 3 and 4. Um, he rejected those in relation to MACE and stroke in 4. So those are post-stroke or TIA as a transient ischemic attack, which is one of the two common forms of stroke. So he rejected our case on those. Those two findings are the subject of grounds two and three of our appeal, uh, which Mr. Pitchin will come on to address you in, in relation to in due course. Um, now, where we say the judge got it wrong for the purposes of our first ground of appeals, having made those findings of fact in 231 and 2, um, he should then not have, it was an error of principle, to go on and reject Servier's case on issue C, preliminary issue C, on a wholesale basis. Um, because the, the upshot, as I alluded to earlier on, is that the principle of reasonableness, at least within the law of mitigation, or unreasonableness for the purposes of mitigation, never required any PCT or health board anywhere in the UK to take any step toward it but beyond what those that they did take to, to encourage prescribing of an alternative to perindropil. Um, now, he didn't reach those conclusions because expenditure on ACE inhibitors was unimportant, because the evidence before him uh, was that it's often a very substantial item in, in the budgets. And that's, again, not surprising, because these are long-term prescriptions. They're not one-off medications. They're people on medication for a long time. Um, the judgment records various steps that the PCTs and eight health boards could have done to encourage cost-effective prescribing. Um, and we saw a moment ago that the experts agreed that one step in particular they should have done was the local formulary. The judge didn't reject that evidence. Um, so in other words, he didn't find that the relative merit of taking further steps to encourage cost-effective prescribing were homogenous across all the PCTs and health boards. Um, in fact, the judge reflected at paragraph 263 that there was local variation. And, and of course, there was um, 263. It's worth just looking at that very briefly. Um, uh, so this is in relation to the various volumes of prescriptions across the country as a whole. They're national aggregated figures there. A survey emphasized there are significant variations at local level. Um, for example, in some PCTs, the, the proportion of printer pills, the total of all ACE inhibitors, was considerably higher than the national average. So, so where do we say the judge fell I I I into error? We, we say that given the highly heterogeneous nature of the PCTs, 
The judge should have gone on to consider whether reliable conclusions could be drawn from the factual evidence he has heard. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, this was akin to a survey, or well, not uh, akin to carefully selected respondents, and the effect of that evidence was something that he should have considered. We went into detail in relation to those three uh, PCTs and health boards. And I'll come on in a moment to how he addressed that in, in, in the judgment. Um, but there was a risk of unreliable conclusions where, in, as there had been here, no disclosure, which would have enabled Servier to fairly test the evidence of other PCTs. And we hadn't even had full disclosure in relation to the PCTs that had been chosen. What happened was documents were produced. And I'll come on in a moment to because that's something which the respondent, the point the respondent's making. So we were left to challenge evidence and the, 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 the documents that had been submitted without the bigger picture. And frankly, we had to do the best we can, trying to show inconsistencies and, and to pick up the witnesses and on, on the, the assertions they've made. Um, can I just pick up two striking evidence, two striking aspects of the evidence before the judge, which are both in the supplemental bundle. So supplemental bundle tab one, Um, so this is the Department of Health departmental report from 2006. Um, as you might imagine, they have a look at what PCTs were doing across the country and how effective they were. Um, so tab one of the supplemental bundle. And if you look at page two, um, you'll see that they gave them star ratings, a bit like a sort of Michelin restaurant. Um, so they, they either had three stars, two stars, one star, or zero. Um, and for primary care trusts, 5175, so bottom left-hand column, there were 58 on three stars, 158 on two, 80 on one star, and seven on zero, um, which wasn't, I mean, obviously, even on the Department of Health's own assessment, there were some, uh, one often hears about sort of Ofsted, Ofsted schools not doing particularly well in certain schools. There were PCTs that at the relevant time were at least by this scaling, rather crudely, not, not doing terribly well on their star ratings. And actually, if you look at 5178, the previous year, there were even more on the zeros, and that was something to be celebrated that some had come off. There, was, there were then only seven really, really bad ones, but actually that was a fall um, uh, 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 as well. So um, I was... It, it, some of these PCTs were doing much better than others. As, 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 and, you know, that's no criticism of the overall system. It's just the, reflects the reality of a hugely diversified group of different PCTs. Um, given the sums of money involved, it also, if we could look at tab three, you will see that the National Audit Office had some interest in this. So tab three in the supplemental bundle. This is an NAO report prescribing costs in primary care. And this report looked at different ways of moderating the growth in drugs expenditure that had become a real problem at that time. Um, and then can we turn up page 19 in the bundle, page 14 in the report? And if you just look at, look at the, so we're here dealing with Angie, renin angiotensin drugs across there and just look at the, the variation in what people are paying so the lowest was southwest dorset that's obviously doing particularly well on average it was 17p um the highest was 28 southport where obviously some sort of had some uh, uh uh prescribers who prescribed more expensive drugs and and you see that is the the the, the, these drugs and trying to get PCTs into the bottom group so everyone was spending efficiently was an important, very important aspect of cost control in the NHS at the time. If you look at paragraph 217, just on page 19, um, you'll see that the level of savings depends on assumptions. As, um, so this is dealing with statins, which are another long-term drug, which called, obviously, as you can imagine, more expensive. The, the indicator for statin prescribing in the bottom 
in prescribing efficiency to achieve the standards of the least efficient in the top 25%. They modelled it, 227 million saving if you could have pulled that off, uh, and 67 million on renin angiotensin drugs. So there's a very diverse group, and one of the things that the NAO and medicines management were doing generally was to try and get the overall bill down. Now, um, the judgment didn't consider the position of each PCT and health board individually, make findings about what steps were taken and conclude that such steps were not taken, did not reasonably need to be taken. In fact, the judge didn't even take that, uh, undertake that analysis for the particular health boards and PCTs in respect of which he'd heard evidence and didn't uh, address our, consider or consider our considerations in respect of uh, those made in our closing submissions on Plymouth, Rhonda, and the Highlands. So the judgment did not proceed at that level of detail, although it was an extremely detailed judgment on other aspects. It didn't look at whether we were right or wrong in the specific things that we had said about those particular PCTs. And um, we say that it is. Uh, Slightly, it is an oddity of the approach that the judge took um, that although we have made those specific criticisms, they're not actually answered or addressed anywhere. And tellingly, the claimants have also ignored them for the purposes of this appeal. Now, it is true that the judge analysed the evidence in relation to each step that Servier said that it should have, should have been carried out in great detail. But none of that evidence, none of that found that particular steps were impracticable or ineffective across the board. What the judge stated, what the judge found was that, was, was that there was diversity. And when it came to the, his ruling on permission to appeal, he, one of the points he made in paragraph 10 of that ruling was that the fact that PCTs and health boards could take steps to encourage cost-effective prescribing was never a matter that was in dispute. The question is, how do you go about dealing with a group of highly diverse PCTs for the purposes of this assessment of the preliminary issue. Um, I don't know, are we, yeah, I'm not sure if it's, whether we should be taking transcriber breaks, but I can, or is that, is that something uh, yes. which? Um, sorry, we probably should do it in that case, five minutes. Is that, is that, I'm sorry, if that's convenient. That's fine, it's convenient.
yeah. as a bit clearer for which of this is going to be practice, which is exactly what we're going to be doing. Rather than engaging in this kind of brain work, we're going to be able to know what this is going to be for which of the different pieces to work across three different capacities. Oh, oh, my lord, the, um, if I can pick up a, a discrete point, which uh, you would have seen from the skeleton arguments is something which the respondents rely on, and the judge also considered in detail. Um, this is the relevance of Servier's marketing. Now, um, the reality is that drugs companies market to sell their products, and they do that to clinicians who are prescribing or have a prescribing choice. And so that is uh, one of the factors that was live before the judge, and he heard evidence from one of Servier's representatives, and you'll see, if I just take you to the relevant sections of his judgment where he looked at that. Um, so that's 362 in the judgment to 363. <coughs> So, so there was Servier, Servier accepts that its marketing efforts are a relevant consideration in the context of this mitigation defence. We don't seek to suggest otherwise. We don't challenge the judge's findings in relation to this. Um, but the judge rightly concluded in this section of judgment that, the ju that PCTs and health boards would not necessarily have been influenced by that marketing. Um, in fact, the evidence before him, that, that wasn't a surprising conclusion, because a large point of the medicine's management techniques that were the subject of this trial and that we saw evidence on was to give prescribers more objectively useful information than that pres provided by pharmaceutical companies, uh, somewhat self-serving marketing efforts. And um, in the judge's 
permission to appeal ruling, if we could just look at that, so that's the core bundle tab seven. So core bundle tab seven, uh, page 187. The, the, the judge's conclusion of paragraph 363 is, in very, is in entirely general terms covering the, the totality of the claimants. Yes. Uh, totality of the PCTs. What he's saying there is, is um, that um, the damages that they can claim should not be reduced by uh, the, uh, the survey. Sorry, the, the, the damages they suffered um, should not be reduced because they were not reasonably required to do precisely what Survey A made sustained and calculated efforts to dissuade them from doing. So in the context of the preliminary issues trial, that's an overall conclusion which you don't challenge on this appeal. Um, my Lord, no, we don't challenge the, 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 the factual finding, but if I can just take you to his permission... But does it matter whether the individual... Uh, PCTs were or were not influenced because the, the, that's the judge's overall finding. Well, my lord, it's not a. It, 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 in my submission, it's not. Th this finding is not one that cuts across the entire exercise. No, no, but no, I mean, no, so, uh, and I'm it, only it, suggesting is, as it were, a sort of killer point. No, yes. But but it is nonetheless um, an important consideration. No, and, it, uh, and when one descends into the detail of the individual PCTs. It, it, it may, be, it may be. I mean, just thinking aloud, really, Mr. Saunders. You can tell me, shut up. Um, we'll do that one. If, if, <laughs> if, if you know, the, the, the extent of the influence may ve will vary from PCT to PCT. Of course, it will. Yeah. But it's rather like um, uh, a, a misrepresentation case where, if if there's any if, um, inducement at all, that that is at least. Uh, in any sense of material inducement, it doesn't matter whether, whether it's um, the um, the innocent party would, would has been influenced in doing what he did by other things. If in fact the, the misrepresentation is is um, a an effective cause, and it's the same sort of issue here. Well, my, my lord, in relation to the misrepresentation situation, it's one of certainly if you have misrepresentation which forms one of a number of series of different mm -hmm. motivations to take a particular, to, to rely upon it, mm -hmm. then the law doesn't say one's entitled to, to let one off the, the misrepresentation because there are other mm -hmm. relevant causes. I mean, that, that, and, and you can see why that might be a sensible but it's approach. The same, it's the same principle here, isn't well, it? But to the extent that, your clients were going around saying, don't switch from our drug because our drug's the best drug. And you're now trying to say, you, you you were trying to say in the preliminary issues trial. Well, actually, when we said that, you shouldn't really have listened to what we were saying. You shouldn't have um, paid attention to that because it wasn't correct. Well, my lord, uh, I'm not, I wouldn't put it in those terms. Well, but but no, I'm putting I'm, it in so, rather. Yes, I know it's possibly rather starker <laughs> approach than I, than I might, as you can imagine, say. But the the the, the point there is that the judge. This was so marketing, uh, <coughs> drugs companies market, and we know that the evidence I can't, I've, it, that, that was that Servier's marketing team was no bigger or smaller than Aptic and Apotex no, no. and various other people. So there are these drug reps going around marketing to people in the NHS. And the judge heard evidence from various of the witnesses about how, how much credence they gave them. And one of the, there was a, a, a GP whose name I forget now, saying that actually this was pretty much at the bottom of his pile of relevant information. You know, they might be good for the golf umbrellas, but that, you know, the rest of it gets filed very carefully in the small circular object in the corner of his office. Yes. Um, uh, and um, that was the sort of thing, I mean, so this is part of the mix, and we are not saying that, um, we're not saying that it isn't relevant, but it isn't that what the judge didn't do was say that this is in some way almost akin to an estoppel because the no. approach that the approach that my lord takes with the misrepresentation case is the law there actually as it were protects the victim of the misrepresentation by saying that you can't then slice up the different causes mm. uh, uh, to do this exercise that was something that was live here but it fell away not not in, obviously in the context of misrepresentation but this sort of pseudo estoppel you're the ones going out there nobbling the, the people in the NHS. You're not entitled to come back and now say 
actually you should, your medicines management function should have taken this information together with all the other information yeah. uh, and do that. And that, that, so that was not, there is, as it were, no legal impediment to this. It's a purely yeah. factual question. And what, read fairly, what we say is that when you look at this section of the judgment, um, it, it, this is in relation to, in particular, uh, this, this part of the judgment was in relation to switching programs, yes. so it's limited to, to that. But it's not a rejection of the rest of our case for, 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 for these various marketing reasons. They are, it's just a factor to take into account. Sorry, well, no, I mean, you, more generally, it is an aspect of your case that uh, you say that it was unreasonable for the claimants to do exactly what you were telling them to do. I mean, again, my lord, I wouldn't characterise it in that way. What, what, what we were doing, we were marketing our pharmaceutical um, in the, the way that pharmaceuticals commonly marketed. Um, that was a source of information which the clinicians received, some clinicians received, um, in certain local places, that may have been an effective, that may have been something that they particularly placed weight on. In others, like with GP I was mentioning a moment ago, it's just part of the melee of material he receives and it goes in the bin. And I follow the effectiveness may vary, but it was part of your general message uh, that the NHS should not switch to generics. And now you complain that it was unreasonable of them not to switch to generics. Well, uh, my, my lord, that, that was certainly, the, the, the marketing message was to promote the, 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 the Servier's product cover cell. But it is not a, um, it, it, it's, the, 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 the context is that the PCTs, the medicines management teams at the PCTs, um, understood that this was dealing with this material from Servier and all the other big drugs companies that comes in was part of their job. And that is an aspect of, uh, as it were, the, the fight against the marketing, or to look at the marketing highly critically. And it does, there were various studies that the judge saw about how this type of material is often in the bottom, you know, when, when GPs are asked what's the most reliable surveys, what's the most reliable information that you rely on, um, they say these national things produced independently by um, various entities in the NHS, some local guidance, and then right down at the bottom of the list was some flyer I've received from GSK or Servier or whoever else. It was a bit more than that, though, wasn't it? I mean, it was quite a sustained campaign, quite a sophisticated and sustained campaign of sending what? around specially trained um, marketing people who presumably had medical qualifications or something. Uh, well, my lord, so, so they are the, the reps, so to, uh, the evidence was it was done by drugs reps mm. um, in the same way that actually all the other, there was no suggestion that this was done in a, a different no, no, time to not the other drugs companies. your class had some super duper different no, we from anybody else but I mean, you know the, the, this isn't sort of su um, some somebody turning up in a sort of in a van uh, with a whole load of kind of um, samples in the back of the van which he's trying to sell like somebody selling brushes in the old days but this no. is quite sophist quite a sophisticated um, system of, of marketing and campaigning, isn't it? Yes, uh, well, my lords, uh, like any other marketing, the, the, you tune your messages to the, the audience that you're sure. addressing. And, you know, uh, if, if your audience is an audience of doctors, then you'd be a not a terribly effective marketer or a rather short-lived marketer if you didn't address, if you turned up in the van and opened the back and said, there you go, chaps. It's not, that, that is not going to not going to work with that audience. And so it, it is sophisticated in the sense that, like all other drugs companies, they are promoting to that group. But in a way, the sophistication of the recipient is also, I mean, we're not marketing, this is not selling things out of the van to people passing on the street. Not it's, not no. I, I mean, I quite follow that what you were doing was no different to what other drug companies were doing. I quite follow that the extent to which what you were doing had any influence on anybody but it was part of the message that you were getting out was that what your product was better than the generics. Uh, well, it was better. So the generics are directly equivalent. So it was better than the other ACE, equivalent ACE inhibitors. So ramipril, mycinopril. Yes. Yeah. So that was part of that was part of the, the message.
But so to that extent, better in terms of but not, not, not better in terms of clinically, more clinically efficacious. It was just that you should be prescribing. So, so I, I, is that right? I've forgotten. Yes, I, 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 somewhere in the. I, I know. I, 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 I think well, mainly to perhaps over the shorter terms, I can just come back. Uh, come back to this and just get this absolutely right. Because I asked for the point. Don't take up more time now. No, no, I'm sorry, my lord. I think I, I'm getting messages that I may be yeah, off okay. so that we yeah. get it right or not. We've taken you slightly out of it. Well, no. I, so, so I just wanted to. So, so the way that the judge approached this was by identifying that it was one of a number of other factors, but it's mm. not to, to take my lord's point a knockout blow or some no. other kind of supervenient point which cuts across everything else. It was just part of the melee, um, and as I intimated earlier, the um, there is. This was not, as it were, akin to an estoppel or some other. I mean, these other arguments were tried and dropped. So, it, it, you know, for, for right or wrong, the evidence was the evidence, and that was something which the judge weighed up. But this was not, in the judge's reasoning, a point which cut across. And just, just where we were looking at that section in the judgment, that was limited to, to switching anyway. Just before you leave, paragraph 363, which you referred us to, the judge does seem to say as a sort of overarching point, when it comes to switching, you're trying to persuade not just GPs, but PCTs not to switch a whole range of arguments, doesn't matter whether they're good arguments or bad arguments, so you, you're trying to persuade them not to switch. And he says, the claimants were not reasonably required to do precisely what Servier made efforts to dissuade them from doing. And that does seem to be a general, I mean, it's, it's, it may not be put quite in terms of estoppel, but it's put in terms of reasonableness, but, which is the, the correct metric for mitigation. Yes. But what he's saying is, for reasonable mitigation, you can't complain that the thing you asked them to do, they went and did, which is picking up my words point. And that does seem to be where he ends up. Is that, well, is that something you challenge as a principle? Um, well, my lord, it's not part of my appeal. No, uh, that's what but, I, that's what I the reason I don't need to incorporate it because, uh, for a start, this is only in relation to switching. I've it, it, that. It's so, it's so it's a narrow, to narrow focus within the entire, yeah. as it were, panoply of behaviours. But um, the, the um, whether, it, as I say, the, 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 if, 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 as it were, we come to come to a, a clinician and or we come to a PCT and say, well. Here's, here's, um, this is the reason why uh, we, we hypothetically mark it in a particular way in relation to them. Um, that doesn't, in some way, uh, uh, say, absent some other basis or some elevation of this point to being a general reasonableness point that cuts across all of the other behaviours, this is not in itself something, especially where the recipients of that marketing, be it the PCT's me medicine management team or the doctor, to form their own uh, views and look at that information critically amongst all the other information that they were receiving. And, and again, as I, as I say, this is, this is one of the, when I was coming at this on an appeal, it's a bit difficult because you haven't seen the, the kind of melee of information that doctors receive from all the drugs companies. But well, it is. The judge comes back to this point because it's already 391. And, and there, the, the point my law says, which is, is even more stark, as he put in, in, he really is put there. Well, my Lord, well what I... he's saying there, as I understand it, is that because you couldn't demonstrate that, because you, Servier, on whom the burden of proof lay, could not demonstrate that they, the health authorities had failed unreasonably to observe, to observe clear standards in the provision of medicine management, which you might not have, so an overall general standard, then given their efforts to persuade the doctors not to uh, or uh, to persuade them to prescribe perindopril and their efforts to stop the health authorities from, from initi initiatives that would have led to switching or, or use of other drugs, then um, your uh, failure to mitigate argument fails. So it does seem to be, at that stage at least, the judge seems to have considered it, true it is it's not a knockout blow, I, I agree, but he does seem to have considered it, uh, it to be um, extremely important. Yes, no, I, I'm certainly not s suggesting that the judge didn't consider it important, but the when one gets, I'll take my lords through, because there are these 
particularly critical section of the judgment 389 to 391. Yeah. I'll, I'll take my look through that if I may, yeah. step by step. But the where he makes this this observation is after having what we characterise as a rather boxed us in, because mm -hmm. he says, well, you we didn't manage to to come up with a criterion which one could identify the subset of PCTs that we're particularly interested in. Uh, and then this is, as, as it were, a kind of sweep up point mm -hmm. in his reasoning. But actually, in my submission, the, what we say is the, the error in the judgment, this doesn't, as it were, provide an independent reason why that wasn't an error. It's read fairly, a, a, a more general consideration that is not an across the board consideration. <coughs> it's a, just in the light of his earlier reasoning in his paragraphs. As I say, if I may, I'll come, come on to those. Here, but actually, probably it's convenient to do that now. Yes. Just work through those paragraphs, if I may, with my lords. Carefully. So 388 is the place where, so look at the judgment, page 108 in terms of numbering. Uh, paragraph 388 um, reflects our submission. So we developed an alternative contention that even if not all PCTs and health boards should reasonably have taken some steps, those with higher rates of prescribing should have done so. Uh, so we accepted the standard of reasonable conduct as a general one across species health board, but submitted that what constituted reasonable conduct and part of that varied. So it depends on their individual circumstances. That was the case that we developed, and I showed you a moment ago where in our, that, that, that fairly reflects what we had said in our skeleton argument. Um, 389, he then goes on to say it was not pleaded, um, and he rejects the submission on the basis that survey had not pleaded that PCTs or health boards with higher prescribing should have taken steps that may not have been required by those with lower prescribing. Uh, the judge said that if we had alleged that PCTs or health boards with higher prescribing rates should have taken further steps, it would have been subject to an RFI, uh, Part 18 request, uh, probing the precise criteria um, according to which PCTs should or should not have been required to take those particular steps. So the judge acknowledges that for Servier to do this, we need some precision. But our point, my lord, is that for us to be to, to be required to do that <coughs> exercise, that precise, as it were, to aim our laser on the correct things, we have to be equipped with tools to get the laser running. And for that, we need disclosure. And so what we say is that this approach, which the judge took, effectively puts us in an impossible position. Um, and it came at the end of obviously a very detailed judgment dealing with all of the individual aspects of the evidence. But actually, the point on this appeal is actually, as, as, as I'll develop in a second, really quite a narrow one. It's how does one then, in the light of that evidence, go about dealing with the conundrum that's presented by the individual PCTs that make up the basis of, 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 of the claim. And um, the difficulty that we were in is that um, if we if if um, uh, we're, we're stuck because if we heads we we can't plead because we don't have the materials to do the pleading, but then tails we we don't have the pleading, so we're, the case is dismissed because we can't put it forward, and that we say is 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 the error of principle in particular that that vitiates these paragraphs three eight nine and, and three ninety. Um, can, it's also important, my lords, just to be fair to the judge, to look at his reasons for refusing permission yes. to appeal, because he deals with some of these points there. Can we look at, so that's in the core bundle, tab 7. Yeah. That's the next section, is it? So, um, just, just, to, uh, just while we're in this document, can we just look at paragraph 10? Um, so this is uh, just reverting back to the dis discussion about uh, marketing. Um, so paragraph 10 on page 187 of the bundle. Uh, the judgment held it's not unreasonable having regard to a host of considerations addressing each of the different steps. Considerations included the priority of marketing calculated efforts. These included the sustained and calculated efforts. Uh, see the judgment. Surveys grounds of appeal do not assert to, assert to assert that this was an irrelevant consideration. We certainly don't say that. Um, and then if we can look at 12, um, 
So survey accepted at trial that for the purpose of preliminary as you see, it had to establish a general standard that would be applied across all PCTs and health boards. The court did not reject Servier's alternative case because Servier did not identify at trial which PCT or health boards should have taken additional steps and failed to do so, as, as its submissions under ground one suggest. The alternative case was rejected because Servier did not advance any clear criteria that could be used for the purpose of such identification. See the judgments at 389. So that's the paragraph we were just looking at. This is not a technical thinking point. Um, if Servier's case had been that the steps should have been taken by any PCT health board where more than, say, 40% of ACE prescribing was of Perindricol for at least two consecutive years, so the judge there formulates a criterion, then that would have put forward a general standard. It could have been addressed by the expert and factual witnesses, and they could have been questioned to determine whether this was a reasonable or practical standard. But Servier's case on this, raised only at trial, remained entirely vague. Um, now, my Lord, so that, that's an important paragraph to bear in mind when you read paragraph 389, because it explains the judge's reasoning in relation to, to 389. <coughs> um, the judge's criticism of our case, as developed, in my submission is therefore that we didn't advance a case that was expressed in the sorts of formulaic terms that he identifies there. Um, for example, any PCT or health board in a particular defined circumstance X should have done this particular defined circumstance Y. Um, but we say that to suggest that Servier should have done this in the absence of wider disclosure is, we, we submit, wrong as a matter of principle. Because if one thinks about it analytically, how could Servier have developed more detailed particulars of that type without knowing what steps PCT and health boards with particular levels of ACE inhibitor prescribing had in fact taken? Imagine that we had put forward a figure of 40% for two consecutive years, the, the formulation that the judge uh, says by way of example in his uh, reasons. Um, that would have prompted two inevitable questions uh, 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 along the lines of the request for further information that the judge identified. First of all, why did you choose 40%? And secondly, what effect does that have on the PCT population? How, how does that, where does it flow through? Why two years, Servier? Now, at that point, I would have flannelled around because that's even more than normal, um, because the answer, the real answer would have been, it's nothing more than guesswork. We're doing the best we can, but we've got absolutely no idea what effect that kind well, of would have had. It would have to be better. I mean, the judge is making the point that this is, this is, a, as it were, a general standard he identifies, or a, a, a yes, a general standard he identifies, presumably based upon expert evidence, not based upon the, the, the individual facts, or the, because the individual facts, the judge realised that it hadn't been disclosure from the individual PCTs. But if you put forward this case at trial, I mean, he's just giving it as an example. No, no, I, I accept that, my lord. I'm not suggesting. Then he, he, then, then I think what he's really saying is, well, if if he'd been, if he, he said this could have been addressed by the expert and factual witnesses. Well, so the experts could have said, well, yes, if 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 um, if the position of any given health health board was that forty percent of prescribing was perindrapol for two consecutive years, then they should have switched. My Lord, yes, so what, what in my submission that's envisaging is that we, as it were, made that assertion, the 40% for two years, mm -hmm. just to take the judge. I'm not suggesting that that in any way is written in stone, no, but no. it's the example the judge gives. We make the assertion 40% for two years at some earlier stage. That then is flushed out through the expert evidence and becomes an issue for the trial, um, in relation to which there was going to be a, a request for further information uh, and on, no doubt intense probing, because one thing this case has shown is that <laughs> every, every proposition is tested somewhat intensely um, so when we're not going up and down to the Supreme Court. Um, so, my, my Lord, the, the, it, the point would have fallen flat, and the difficulty is I can't advance that case without the underlying material, because I've no idea if the 40% cut or the two years, or be it 60% cut, or identify this particular criterion. <coughs> to do that without the expert evidence, or to do that without the, the, the disclosure, is, is an impossible job to do it in any way that is going to be probative. What effectively the judge is doing, in my submission, is he identifying 
that there should have been a criterion, ident uh, but, but at a time in the proceedings where we could not have done it. We are now actually much better informed as a result of having done the preliminary issues trial because we've had Dr. Dwerden go through all the prescribing data and produce all sorts of nice graphs showing how different cuts can, can happen. But we certainly weren't in a position to do that prior to, to, to evidence, I'm sorry, my lords. I mean, if we go on to the next paragraph of the PTA judgment decision, the judge says in an ultimate sentence, the decision to order preliminary issues to establish general standards was taken as a means of proportion of case management. So what he seems to be saying is these preliminary issues are directed at that. They're directed at establishing general standards. That is their scope. Um, uh, and uh, if that is right, then um, plainly it was incumbent on you to formulate a general standard or, or you lost. But, but um, the, 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 the difficulty, well, my lord, that, that's also addressed, my lord, in relation to Stellantis in a moment, which might be the chance that we'll recall from my past year. But um, that, that's the, the, the general standards, because something is now formulated as a general standard, the way that the case was put was a series of general steps which may have different manifestations in different PCTs depending on their individual circumstances. Um, the, that does not, in my submission, mean that. Um, that, 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 that one loses the importance of the individuality for the purposes of our defence, because ultimately this is a, a way of trying to get uh, come up with a mechanism for looking what at. What he's making is that the, the context, in, as I'm saying, the context in which the preliminary issues were produced, the judge, the judge rejected any suggestion there should be disclosure from all consequences. For whatever reason, sampling doesn't seem to have worked. Speaking for myself, I can't quite understand why, but it doesn't seem to have worked. So the judge, the route the judge went down was was this these preliminary issues, which were designed to establish general standards. Yes. Now, now that wasn't um, that 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 the effect of that was, or an effect of that would be that if you fail to show uh, a, a, that the health authorities have failed to comply with a general standard, then that was the end of it in terms of the failure to mitigate. And that's the effect of, of well, my, my what the judge had ordered and, and what the judge has decided. Well, my Lord, as a, as a matter of case management, the way that, so the way that the, the issue developed, I explained earlier to my Lord, in terms of the claimants having enlarged the case by putting in the individual three examples of mm. them and, and, uh, and so on. <coughs> so much of the focus of the preliminary issue trial, although when the judge originally conceived this, he conceived it as, I think I think I said, as a nine-day trial. Mm -hmm. so, um, what, what actually happens, it morphed into a very different thing. Uh, and the question is whether, as it were, we're held, held to the earlier hypothetical or actually the reality of the case as it developed at trial. And the way that the case developed at trial is that the, the court heard very detailed evidence in relation to, take Plymouth. We heard from the medicines manager. We looked at all the minutes of the various meetings. We challenged things that she said, and we put the submissions in. None of that material was dealt with by the judge in the judgment. And the the, the judge's answer to this, as a uh, from, from the from, from the perspective of. Uh, uh, the case to <coughs> see the third preliminary issue as a whole was to say that we had failed by identifying these sorts of criteria, which in my submission we just couldn't possibly have done absent the kind of disclosure. Now, th th that is, in a way, the, the, the difficulty. We are no longer in that difficulty following the evidence and following the trial because we have looked through with Dr. Dwerden and I've cross-examined him for several days or whatever it was on all of this data. So you can now do some of the slicing to do precisely the thing which the Chancellor identified. You spot some of the, the PCTs. But to, 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 as it were, resolve this particular issue in the light of the way the issues developed in that way, we say was it leads to a fundamental unfairness for Serbia because it shuts us out from, from this defence where actually it may be very material indeed. I mean, Isaac, you said you're the victim of two prior rulings 
these two prior rulings. One was you can't have general disclosure in the document. Um, so that come the trial, you simply didn't have this material. But that was the consequence of something decided much earlier. Two, as the judge had certainly said when ruling at the PTR, um, uh, the preliminary issue is looking at the conduct of the claimants across the board and is not concerned with the conduct of particular PCTs. And that, again, was not appealed. So, well, my Lord, first of all, in relation to disclosure, we did ask for specific disclosure, but that application was stayed following the, the adoption of the course of the PCT. Um, preliminary issue C does not say it is limited to general standards. It is but not as formulated. The Senate judge said at the PTA, PTR that it I will, I'll, I'll, yes, I'll come on to that in, yes. in a moment because that's again another point that's take, taken against me. But um, there was, in my submission, we're, we're, I'll come take my lord to that in, in a moment. But there's no judgment we say that said that we couldn't run the, the case in the way we developed it. And actually, when you look at the formulation of the preliminary issue itself, it wasn't, as it were, just looking at sweeping standards. And actually, when you look at the bit of the pleading that it engaged, as I've already taken you too earlier on, quite a lot of that pleading was about the specificity, it was about the local formulary, it was about the, the, the steps that should have been taken in individual trusts. So, oh, my Lord, the, the, in my submission, the other point which, just to address my Lord the Chancellor and uh, the Lord Justice uh, Newey's uh, point, the, the the, the, this point about general standards does not, in my submission, give an answer to our case, which is squarely on the pleadings. Um, it, it, it's, which is that you need to look at the consequence as it affects individual PCTs. Now that is the pleading that was in. Um, what the, 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 as it were, the, 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 the reasoning of the judge that we now criticise on this third issue was effectively to say that by reason of us not having identified something that would have thrown up particularities, we're now foreclosed from doing that. But how can that, in my submission, be an uh, a fair course for my client where the effect of it is to shut us out and we couldn't have done it because we haven't had the disclosure or the materials to enable us to do that? And, and that, my lords, is really the, 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 the crux of of our argument. Um, I mean, to, to, to look at another way of doing it, a, a general standard could have been um, some PCTs should have done some things which uh, PCTs uh, in high prescribing areas. We can't go further than that at this stage. What things should they be carrying out? Well, that the judge could have answered in the light of the evidence he heard in relation to Plymouth uh, and some of the other PCTs, the specificity of the, the PCTs that he had heard. Um, but he uh, chose when that wasn't, didn't form part of his reasoning for the reasons that he gave in 389 to 391. And so he didn't make those findings of fact in relation to those individual PCTs. And so the effect of the judgment <coughs> in my submission was that because it didn't deal with the specific criticisms, which took up quite a considerable time at trial dealing with those witnesses and what we say went wrong, mm -hmm. one's then in a position where we, we, we don't get, uh, it, there's no, obviously, as we're leaping off point, to then identify these bigger, broader considerations that might apply to like PCTs in the same position as Plymouth. Uh, and so, my Lord, that's, that, that is why we say there is an error of principle in the way that this was addressed. Uh, and it, it is, in my submission, particularly acute where you look at the judge's reasoning as it was developed through the um, through the, uh, the the reasons on permission, and the fact that you identified there was going to be inevitably some uh, further information requests and so on. Um, we just couldn't possibly have taken a punt on this. We didn't have an ability. We don't. I mean, how could we have, have done it? So, so that is that, that's why we say it's, it leads, led to a fundamental unfairness. Um, now, one point that has been made by the respondents in their skeleton argument. It is common ground that there is no, full disclosure has not been given in respect of England. Um, but one point that they have made in their skeleton argument is that they have had 
we have had full disclosure in respect of Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So the point they make is that even if our ground one is a good ground, it only applies to England. It doesn't apply to uh, Celtic nations and, uh, uh, and Northern Ireland. Now, it is true that in 2015, um, the Scots and Welsh and Northern Ireland claimants gave substantial number of documents by way of disclosure. But that was before the defence was amended to introduce the prescribing argument in 2016. So that was presumably not produced against these issues becoming live in the case. Um, there was then a considerable amount of time spent in 2016, 2017 on working out the premises of a sampling exercise. Um, on, in 2017, Serbia made an application for disclosure of the PCT's documents, and at the 2018 CMC, um, that application was stayed pending the outcome of the preliminary issue trial. Um, so, um, following that, the Scots and Northern Ireland claimants disclosed further documents, which they said were identified in the course of conducting interviews with potential witnesses. We had then more disclosure given when witness statements were served. And likewise, the Welsh claimants disclosed further documents provided to them by one of their factual witnesses. And whether that is the totality or not, we don't know. So uh, one has to be a little bit careful about that, assu that assertion that we've had everything. We, we don't know. But what that actually shows, and the way that that point developed during the preliminary issue trial and the run-up to it, is that when the claimants sit down with the right personnel from a particular PCT or health board, rather than trying to do a sort of generic top-down disclosure exercise or a central one, those people actually point to a bunch of relevant documents and they say, well, these are the minutes. Oh, you need to look at the minutes of this meeting or that meeting. And those are what we then got produced by those parties uh, uh, along with their witness statements. Um, and that, we say, rather it indicates the way forward. If we use prescribing data to find the right PCTs and health boards, so those that have heavy prescribing of perindropil, <coughs> we can then see uh, then whether those were PCTs or England or health boards in one of the other nations, the claimants can run off and find the right people and get the right documents. Uh, and it is particularly notable, we say, that some of the documents that were exhibited to the witness statements of the non-English claimants had not previously been disclosed. So those were some exhibited to the witness statements of Mr. Hayes and Dr. Herding, for example, who were witnesses at trial. So whether that is England or one of the other nations, the experience that we have all learned through doing this trial is that doing the work, talking to the relevant people in the, uh, in the relevant PCTs will produce relevant documents in a much more efficient way than trying to do some sort of central, huge central exercise. So we say there's nothing in this full disclosure argument because at the moment we don't, the, the way that the incremental, these documents were produced incrementally um, is one thing. But in any event, it doesn't apply to England. But actually what we know now, through having been through this exercise and having been through the evidence, is that we, we can find the right PCTs and health boards. Uh, and as a matter of case management, uh, it could be told to pick them. Um, and then rather than trying to do some sort of humongous disclosure exercise, what then needs to happen is that they need to do just the same as they did with Plymouth Ronda and so and so, identify the right people and get the right minutes and, and the, the local formularies and all the rest of those documents that respond to what was happening at that local level. So actually the exercise of the preliminary issue trial has been of some great utility in that respect. But obviously that doesn't cut across, I mean, just a matter of practicality, it doesn't deal with the, the more fundamental points which my lawyers were raising to me, to me a moment ago about case management and so on. So um, one of the things which um, we say though is that, that, you know, insofar as this really is a case management approach to this, what is the correct approach in this appeal, um, one of the overwhelming uh, considerations we say must be that um, there is no, um, that, 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 that Servier shouldn't be shut out from running what could be a very substantially, a very valuable defense um, in respect of certain, a subset of the PCTs, those that are particularly at the top of the scale, spending lots of money on perindropil, we might succeed on some of those, we might not succeed on others, but we're going to chip a lot of money off the claim. And to do that in these circumstances where incrementally 
the judge viewed it as one thing, the, the reality of the case became something very different. And then at trial, there was an inquiry made. None of that is featured in the judgment. And then we boxed out by the reasoning that the judge takes in those paragraphs. We, we, we say that was wrong as an error of natural principle. Um, can I just go back to the judgment, paragraph 390, which um, my lord was asking about a, a moment ago. Um, so um, it is absolutely right, as the judge observes, that it's our burden. And we don't shy away from it. Um, but um, uh, uh, as you, uh, as my lord was just raising a second ago, Sergei's rights to raise mitigation and contributory negligence defences must be observed, and that's right, because we got permission from Mr Justice Henderson, which wasn't appealed, to refuse them. But as Lord Justice Green recently observed in the Court of Appeal with regard to mitigation defence to a competition damages claim, where the claimant has a justiciable right, the procedural and evidential rules governing the enforcement of that right must not be allowed to become so onerous that they undermine or weaken the very right itself. Now, as a statement of general principle, there's very little to criticise <laughs> in relation to that. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's important, my lords, if you just see the context of that statement by Lord Justice Green, my, the Chancellor, this may have been one of the ones you were mentioning where there were large numbers of last-minute documents coming in, but... Um, <laughs> that one I was thinking. So, uh, well, it's uh, another one. Um, so, so, my lords, the, the Stellantis is in the fourth authorities bundle, authorities for tab 20. Tab 20 of the Fourth Authorities Bundle. Um, the, um, now, we say that that case was about an entirely different situation. It was an application to strike out a defence alleging that a claimant had in fact responded to a secret cartel overcharge, of which it had no knowledge, by negotiating lower prices from its other suppliers. So it wasn't a failure to mitigate case, but one in which it's alleged that the claimant had actually mitigated its loss, as a matter of fact. And if you look at the characterization of the issue, which Lord Justice Green deals with, it, so page 903 in the bundle, paragraph one of the judgment. So the question for the court, as Lord Justice Green formulates it on that appeal, was where a supplier has in breach of duty, tortious contractual or otherwise, charged the purchaser too much from the supplies, can the supplier seek to defeat a claim for compensation brought by the purchaser by pleading that the purchaser has mitigated the overcharge by neutralising the sum in question, by securing commensurately increased discounts on supplies from its other suppliers? Um, in particular, is it permissible to plead such a defence without any actual evidence that the claimant did in fact, you notice the emphasis there, in fact, mitigate its loss in this manner, but only upon the hypothetical basis that it is a reasonable inference that can be drawn that the purchaser is <coughs> mitigated in this matter. That is, in a nutshell, the issue arising on the appeal. So it's, a, so it's a, an entirely different situation. The point that was being run in that case um, was, I hope I don't mischaracterise it, but at least the way that Lord Justice Green describes it, it seems to be that if you have multiple suppliers and one illegally overcharges you, um, it's, it's, is it an inference that you necessarily clobber your other suppliers to get things cheaper from them? Um, but there's no actual evidence, in fact, that that was happening. So that was the question before the court. Um, now, that was the context for the observation that the judge, Lord Justice Green, quoted, uh, made, and that was quoted in paragraph 390 of Mr Justice Roth's judgment uh, before my lords. Um, so it's about the question about a claimant meeting an onerous disclosure obligation and a trial burden in relation to a mitigation defence and whether it stifles a claim. Um, but look at, if we can look at Keeping Stellantis, just look at paragraph 81. Um, so 81 recognises that um, the, the, um, the, 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 um, I'm sorry, that the, um, that the court can't stifle a le legitimate mitigation defence either. 
And so this is the section that deposits the short answer. This is if a defendant does not have any realistic evidence of a possible defense. I'm just looking at the bottom of uh, paragraph 81 on page 95 of the book. Then it has no right to go fishing in disclosure to see if there's anything that might turn up which might help. As the gap below and in Royal Mail observe, there's, there has to be a properly pleadable starting point before the claimant is put to the heavy burden of, of that disclosure. Uh, uh, the, sorry, that disclosure involves. In this case, the pleading simply doesn't arrive at the starting point. So, so the, the the point there is, if your if your inferential case is hopeless, you shouldn't embark on a disclosure exercise to try and fish around to see if something turns up. And but that must be right as a general proposition. You don't demur from from, 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 from from that. But it, but it's the absolute paradigm of an unwarranted fishing expedition. But that's far a long, long way removed from the position in this case, in my submission, following the PI trial. What we have is a, a chain of reasoning, which we reflected in our submissions, that has been gra grounded in findings of fact that the judge made. Now, on some of those we prevailed, on others we didn't. Um, and two of them before my lords in the second and third ground. But the judge didn't reject those factual premises in toto at trial. Instead, our defense failed for a point of principle, the lack of a formula that could be applied to flush out those particularly interesting PCTs on health forms. So in a way, what the way that the judge, the way the judge's reasonings work is in, in effect, I, I, I hope this is a sort of un, unkind characterization, but in effect, we were being <coughs> asked to do the sampling exercise or to come up with a criteria that would produce the sample, um, having gone down a, a very different tack as a matter of case management. And that is perhaps another way of looking at this relative to being a case management decision. Because if the case management decision was one to go down this road of not having um, gone down the route of sampling, it's then we say fundamentally unfair to then find that we were uh, we, we can't. We have no consequence to see because we hadn't come up with some criteria that produces a subset of the sample that we should be looking at. So we say there's nothing in Stellantis. Uh, there's nothing inherently implausible or theoretical uh, about this case, uh, and you know it, it's a very different case because we have evidence that some there's a very diverse spectrum of PCTs or health boards, and some of those. Are, are likely to have felt to the extent that a reasonable PCT or health board would have taken. And when it came to the three that had been selected by the claimants, we had very specific criticisms of what they had done. And just to turn to those, in relation to Plymouth, Servier said there was no good reason why Plymouth waited until 2006 or 2007 to put in an incentive scheme when it could have done so in 2004 or 2005. Um, in relation to Rhonda, we said that the schemes operated in 2006 to 2007 should have encouraged generically available ACE inhibitors instead. So they had a scheme, but they just didn't choose to have the, have the generics up there. Um, and none of the reasons in relation, to, given in the judgment in three five, paragraph 356, um, are capable of answering those specific criticisms of what was done at Plymouth and Rhonda. And we say if we were given similarly focused disclosure and evidence in relation to other PCTs and health boards, in particular you look at the subset that has heavier prescribing, there's every reason to think that we'd be able to make similar criticisms of at least some of those. Because where you're spending a lot of money and you have a mitigation, you have this, these, these processes in place, you have local formularies, um, it, it, it requires some explanation, we would say, if you've got a formulary, mentioning things that you don't haven't put the current report down the list. I mean, it's some, in some respects, it's not even more complicated point than that. But to shut us out from being able to run those kind of points, where we're up for a claim for many hundreds of millions of pounds, 200 million plus, or I don't know, probably way more than that, they would say now, um, is, we would say, fundamentally unfair. Um, and another way to look at it is if, if, you, if the claim had just been a, a claim by Plymouth PCT, then there's no question that we would have had disclosure from Plymouth PCT um, of its documents, and we could have had an opportunity to plead in relation to Plymouth what we say they specifically should have done once we've looked at that. Um, 
we may say, for example, that Plymouth should have put in a script switch prompt or something else. Um, and that, that all those points would have been flushed out. But what we say can't, it shouldn't, it isn't fundamentally fair, and this feeds into what we say is the error of principle that has arisen. Um, because simply because we have been sued by all four health nations services in an omnibus claim brought by all of the PCTs and health boards in a single case, effectively, um, in which the NHS seeks hundreds of millions of pounds of damages made up at slices of loss here and there. Some PCTs will be big contributors, others will just be riding along with piddly amounts of critical spending. Um, we say that it, it, grouping them together, the fact of the grouping together, um, sh shouldn't, as a matter of principle, make it more difficult for Serviet to run its defence, which relies upon the individual circumstances of the PCTs. And that is a question for case management. Uh, and the question is, how do you look at which are the most important PCTs? Because it's not going to be 250 of them or whatever the number is. It's going to be a subset, 10, 15, 20, whatever. I mean, I'm not quite sure. No one knows how they, the claimants came to their decision to focus on Plymouth, for example. But there must be something about Plymouth that, that, that they found particularly attractive, that, that sort of attracted the magpie eye of... Of, 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 of the claimant. So, so given we say that Servier has succeeded in the preliminary issue trials for showing that much, for much of ACE inhibitor prescribing, carrying, covering much of the relevant period, there were cheaper alternatives available. We've succeeded in demonstrating that there were steps that the PCTs or health boards could have taken to encourage cost-effective prescribing and the unanimous expert evidence was that everyone should have done something, uh, we say that the judge fell into error by dismissing the entirety of our defence without proper disclosure having been given. Um, and uh, just to deal with the pleading point, um, in, in other contexts, the court, this court has recognised that the extent to which particularisation can be given is, of course, context dependent. And we put some authorities in, I mean, my lords will be familiar with them, Chengiz, and, and there's an authority, Selgard, as well, which was for Justice um, Arnold, uh, uh, looking at that. Um, that's particularly the case where there's an information asymmetry between the parties. Um, now, obviously, we're not in, we say, in the Stellantis position, where our defence would be one where we're just making up some hypothetical that you must have nobbled your other customers to get a saving, so we'll have some, we'll have a slice of that. Um, this is actually a factually based pleading. Um, it's been accepted by the court and there's been no appeal on, on that. So the question is now, as a matter of proper case management, if my lords are, are, are with me, that, that when we get to this December CMC, we need to find a, a, a sensible way forward to find that list. Now, maybe the court says, well, we'll, we'll impose a, a chop on the number of PCTs we can go into, or it may be that there are a host of different ways that the court could case manage that, or we could look at the, the sampling. But as I say, obviously I've got to succeed in the appeal first. But one of the things which I do seek to reassure my lord about is that actually the, the, the consequences of us being successful in this do not in some way reopen. It's not as if this case has to be remitted or something else to Mr. Justice Roth. It creates a series of uh, case management questions which need to be, naturally can be dealt with at the forthcoming CMC in a case in which there are currently no directions at all really going forward. Um, so uh, and the question what is... Um, sampling, what did sampling fail? Um, so I think, I mean, uh, this was I'm afraid before I was involved in the case. But, <laughs> uh, the, I think what happened, both parties, so there was, a lot of, there was some expert evidence on both sides about how to approach sampling. Both experts were agreed that sampling as a matter of principle could work, but they were they, where they disagreed is quite how you go about doing it. And um, that evidence was all produced, and the judge at that stage, rather than resolve those questions, decided that actually the way to go was to, to, to do his nine-day preliminary yeah. issue trial. And then, as I say, this morphed into a rather different beast. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, as I say, the... the the thing is that where the parties were back then, 
is, was, is a very different place to where we are now having conducted this trial because we have had expert evidence from Dr. Twerden and the various other parties going through all these different spends, looking at the prescribing data uh, and so on. So the, the court can be informed as a matter of practicality um, in terms of looking at where uh, the, as it were, the hot spots, the, 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 the very, the, if you imagine a sort of heat map of the United Kingdom, there are particular hot spots of parenteral spending, and you can zone in on those because those are obviously likely to be the ones that are worth the most for the purposes of this defence. And as a matter of case management, you know, one can imagine a, a judge saying, well, look, I'm not going to let you trial with them. I'm going to say pick the top 10 or pick the top 20 or whatever it is. Uh, and, you know, that is a very different place than where we are now, where the whole defence has been shut out on the basis that we couldn't identify a criterion 40% for two years or 60% for five years or whatever it was. And that, that's why we say there's an error of principle in relation to the determination of that third issue. Um, could, yes, so, so um, just for reference, we explained the sampling debate in our skeleton argument at paragraphs 16 to 17. Um, so there was no ruling that sampling could not work. No. It's just that the agenda, as it were, shifted to the judge. Yeah. Uh, took, 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 took the case in a different course. Um, so, my lords, the, 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 um, if ground one succeeds, then the consequence is that the judge, we say the judge was wrong to dismiss the entirety of our defence on this without proper disclosure having been given. And then it becomes a question of case management for the court to identify in the light of those general conclusions following the preliminary issue trial, um, which PCTs or health boards require investigation. And that, we say, is something that is not beyond the wit of man to do for the November CMC. Um, the, 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 um, the, Vanessa, what would the order say? Well, so suppose you've succeeded on ground one. At the moment, the order says there'll be judgment for the claimants upon the defence succeed. Um, Could the order say anything, really? Well, I think, my, my lords, we would have to say, obviously we'd have to see how my lords approached it, but we can have a think about exactly how one formulated it. But it would need to say something like, in respect to this, you see, um, the, the, um, the, the, you know, the, 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 the court, um, the issues relating to the identification of the relevant PCTs or health boards are to be considered at the forthcoming CMC and then to give some, some sorts of directions there. It doesn't necessarily have to condescend into the detail of the mechanism by which that might happen. But we vary that judgment in that respect on this UC. Um, and, and so, my lords, uh, I say, if, 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 we, if we get to that happy place, I will <laughs> I can assist my lords <laughs> in due course. But um, that, that, that's a, a, a um, uh, my lord, that, that, that's a, a, a point of detail which I. I would hope is not beyond the, 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 the capacities of the parties to come up with an agreed approach. Um, is that a convenient moment? Yes, it's a convenient moment. Two o'clock.